Welcome to part four in our four-part series on how to accurately measure nanosecond scale networks. I'm Dr. Matthew Grofner, and I'm speaking on behalf of the team at Exablaze. In this part, we're going to look at developing a reliable methodology for picosecond scale measurement of nanosecond scale networks. Previously, we looked at how to quantify the accuracy of network measurement devices and introduced the Exonic HPT, the highest precision timing and capture device available on the market. Finally, we looked at how not to do high-precision network measurement, and the reason for this was the delays were difficult to estimate. So looking back at these difficult-to-estimate delays, the ideal way to solve this problem would be to eliminate them entirely, and we can do this if we rearrange our experimental methodology slightly. The first step to doing this is to remove the optical splitters and the capture device, and the second step is to move towards using both transmit timestamps and receive timestamps instead of the pair of receive timestamps that we've been using so far. Now you can see that if we do this, we haven't actually eliminated all the errors in the system. There will be delays through the transmit side of the device, there'll be delays through the fibers, and there'll be delays in the receive side of the device. But we can eliminate these by taking a measurement of a known device and calculating the delay through our system, and then taking a measurement of an unknown device and subtracting those two values. By doing this, what we do is eliminate all of the errors without having to measure them explicitly. Now the problem with doing this sort of thing is, where do we get a value that has a known latency? Well, there is a device on the market that's very commonly used, which is a simple optical coupler. This optical coupler has a known latency of almost zero. So we could arrange our network experiment to look something like this. We have an optical coupler, and the coupler has a known value of zero, which means that all measurement in the first measurement is essentially error, and then we can subtract all of that error from our second measurement and get a very high accuracy value for our device. The problem with this is that optical couplers have LC couplings on the side of them, and so you can't actually put an electrical device in the middle of there. What we usually do is go through an SFP to do our optical to electrical conversion. If we look at our experiment with this in, we now find that there's an extra piece of delay that we'd have to account for, and this is kind of starting to add more errors that we don't really want. What we'd really like to do is have a measurement that is all copper with the known delay and all copper with our unknown delay. So what we want is some sort of an equivalent to an optical coupler, but in the electrical domain. So we went ahead and built one of these, uh, which is what I have on the slide now, and this is an electrical to electrical coupler with almost zero delay. Now, Obviously that value is not exactly zero, so what we did was we built three of these, one with an almost zero delay, one with an almost zero delay plus a known offset, and one with an almost zero delay plus another known offset. And then we could apply our standard trick of figuring out what the uh, curve is that meets these points, uh, and as a side effect we ended up calculating the propagation delay inside of APCB, which is an actually an interesting value to know as well. And for this particular experimental setup, we found a constant offset of 9.91 nanoseconds. So we now have our known value, which we can apply to measuring our unknown device. And so what we have now is a very high precision measurement methodology for doing picosecond scale measurement on nanosecond scale devices. Now, what you may wonder is whether we could apply that same measurement methodology to measuring something like an optical SFP device. So this is exactly what we've done. We applied the same setup where we have an optical coupler and our copper copper coupler, uh, and we again use these uh, to eliminate errors in each other's systems. By doing so, we can plot a curve, and that curve has a y-intercept, and we can then subtract those two y-intercepts uh, to find out what the latency is through the SFPs. And so by doing so, we get a latency of about 1.02 nanoseconds. Now, if you recall from part two, you may remember that we found an SFP latency of about 830 picoseconds using that measurement. In this case, we've now got about 1,000 picoseconds. Well, the problem with this is that our measurement is now approaching the resolution of the device that we're using, and so it's actually quite difficult to estimate where we're going wrong in this place. I would say that a fair estimate is somewhere in between those two values of about 925 picoseconds. Now, for those of you that don't have one of these copper-copper couplers, uh, I'd be very confident with doing a measurement using an optical coupler and then estimating about half of that for each delay through each SFP, uh, which is what we're uh, showing on the slide here. Now, obviously, at Exablaze, we do have these copper-copper couplers, so whenever we do measurements, we do use the copper um, methodology, which means that we can be very sure about the measurements that we're taking. So the question is, well, why don't we use this to measure something real? 
One of the products that Exoblaze makes is called the Exolink Fusion Fast Mux or Fast Multiplexer. For those of you that don't know, a multiplexer is a device that takes many connections uh, and aggregates them to be one. So in this case, many 10 gig connections are aggregated to become one 10 gig connection to share usually an expensive connection somewhere. So we've applied this measurement methodology to our Exoblaze fast FastMux. Uh, we've taken our timestamp in the transmit and timestamp in receive, subtracted out the errors, uh, and calculated delay through the device. In fact, what we've done is applied this to many different inputs uh, and then formed a characterization curve of all of the different inputs so that you can get a sense of what the best, median, and worst case performance is through this device. I won't go into any further details here. The full characterization report is available from the Exablaze website under the Exalink FastMux tab. Bringing now together all of the work that we've done over the last few um, parts, we were looking at quantifying the accuracy using standard deviations, and we've worked on producing a measurement methodology that can do very high accuracy measurement. So when we measure the Exablaze uh, fast mux, what we get is a delay of 48.79 nanoseconds through the device. Now, remembering that our device has a standard deviation of 0.2 nanoseconds, uh, and this is the minimum value observed, we can actually say that the delay is somewhere between 48.79 and 48.79 plus 0.2. So that's 48.79 to 48.99. And we call this approximately 49, which is why we quote the device as a 49 nanosecond device. We can apply a similar logic to the median and maximum values, uh, and again, we can summarize those. So when we talk about our 49 nanosecond device, we actually mean an absolute minimum of 49 nanoseconds, a medium of 54, and a maximum of 60. And we can be very certain about those values because we've properly characterized our device, we're using a very high measurement uh, resolution device, and we're using a very good measurement methodology. So that's the end of part four. Uh, in summary, I'd like to just go through some of the gotchas that we've discovered along the way. So we learned that uh, device precision is not always equal to the reporting precision. Uh, we learned that accuracy does matter a lot more than resolution when doing this sort of measurement. And we also learned that copper isn't always faster than fiber. Finally, we learned that one meter isn't actually the same as 1.0 meters, and that all of these issues need to be taken account when doing high precision measurement. Likewise, the tips that we found along the way. Firstly, always round to the nearest multiple of the clock period of the device that you're using, or use a device or a format that conveys the full precision. Secondly, uh, do quantify and calibrate the accuracy of the devices that you're using first, so that you can be sure of the error bounds before you actually take a measurement. Also, we've come across some very useful constants, values for propagation delays in fiber, copper, and PCBs, as well as a delay value for SFPs. And finally, if you're very interested in maintaining absolute minimum latency through your system, get your copper from Exablaze. This is the conclusion of our series on how to accurately measure nanosecond scale network devices. I'm Dr. Matthew Grosvenor, and I've been speaking on behalf of the team at Exablaze.